I'm Dante Bosco, and you're watching Hollywood Real with Jay Menace. All right, Dante, thanks for joining me today, man. Yes, my Long pleasure. Long time coming. I know, that's good. I can't <laughs> wait to catch up and, you know, talk about talk about the town, as it were. We go way back. We've done a lot, some some cool projects together. I know, a really, a really, a really fun film, Dead Thieves, <laughs> great film. Yep, and I want to talk about that, too. But before we go too far, who are you? Uh, my name is Dante Bosco. Uh, I've been an actor uh, in Hollywood for over 30 years now. It's like, I think it's my 34, 33rd year or something crazy like that. I feel so young to be saying things like that. You are. Uh, and so uh, my over my career, a lot of people know me um, from characters like Rufio from the movie Hook, uh, you know, discovered by Steven Spielberg, 90s, um, up to some of my, uh, you know, working all throughout the 90s and 2000s. And another popular character I'm known for is Prince Zuko um, from Avatar The Last Airbender as well as uh, Jake Long, the American Dragon for Disney. I did for a bunch of years. So uh, I've been very fortunate in my career over the last 30 years. Uh, and also just as being an, an Asian American actor in Hollywood and one of the uh, one of the only, you know, one of the hand, you know, very few Asian American actors through those periods that have been able to kind of survive the town and be able to continue to work and, and help put out the images of uh, people of color in Hollywood. So I've been a big uh, voice in Asian American and people of color in Hollywood for the last few years, and that's important to me too. So, every once in a while, I turn on the TV and I'm watching something, and you pop up on there. I didn't even, didn't I even know. know you were on it. That's I know crazy. I pop up in the, the strangest places, especially with all the platforms these days and media flying around. Um, you know, it's one of those things that I, I started acting so young, and it's really an interesting thing when I when I meet people of our generation, uh, and they remind me, like you know, they grew up with me. Like they, I, I was, they were able to see me grow up on screen throughout the years, and and they grew up too. So it's like we grew up together, and it's kind of that kind of really interesting, fun relationship with the audience, especially as we move into this era of social media, where the engagement is very, very much different than it was uh, in the '80s and '90s. Mm. What was your first uh, big movie? Was it Hook? Uh, no, actually, um, my whole career started like me and my brothers. Our whole, my whole career. And they're all actors and filmmakers, and my sister also. Uh, we were a breakdancing group in the Bay Area, in San Francisco. So our whole, my whole career in the entertainment industry actually started at the ground level of the entertainment industry. And I always talk about that, and the actual ground level of the entertainment industry, at least for me, was the actual ground. Because we were street performance in the streets of San Francisco, uh, the Bay Area, you know, like Pier 39, um, Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, all around, and we literally were the kids on the weekends in the streets with the, you know, with the boombox and the cardboard box flattened out and the hat in the street, and we were we were dancing, hip hop, break dancing, b boy in the golden era of hip hop in the '80s, and we became really popular in the Bay Area, right? So much so we performed for uh, we were like Bay Area like heroes, like local legend heroes, where we were we were performing for the Oakland A's and San Francisco 49ers and we had won like within a year's time we'd won like over 30 breakdance competitions on the weekends you know and then we got a scholarship to the San Francisco Ballet Company we started studying ballet did the Nutcracker with them and then my my mother you know there's a whole thing that happened where they're like do you want to move to LA like do you guys want to go to Hollywood like we become like kind of a big fish in a small pond up there and uh, there came a time, I was like, do you guys want to make the jump to LA, jump in the car, drive down the five, six hours, and like set up camp in Hollywood? And I do remember that conversation. And they went to each brother individually, you know, like, do you want to do this? And I was like, yes, let's go. And we moved to LA, and that's when my career started as an actor. And uh, we moved, and I was 10. That's when I was 10. We got to LA when I was 10, right? So all that happened before I was 10, and me and my brothers. And then when we started acting, um, we started studying and it's very important to study. You know, my mother really wanted us to, if we were gonna start acting to really get a, a, a to learn. Look with anything, it's like you have to learn what you're doing. It, nothing happens magically, it's all training and all that kind of stuff. So we started studying. And I do have 
you know, certain magical things that happen. It's like one of those guys that the first audition I went out for, like I booked. And then it was a TV show called The Wizard. And I was actually playing Native American on that show, which is ironic or strange, um, being some Filipino. But over my career, I've played so many different ethnic groups, every, any, from all different Asian ethnicities to Latino ethnicities and Native American a few times. So uh, I did book that first thing I auditioned for, and then I kind of just kept rolling. Um, I think one of the first major things I did, I did a movie called uh, The Perfect Weapon for Paramount Pictures with Jeff Speakman, and that was really cool. And, uh, and there's reoccurring themes in your life, because at that time I played uh, a, a street urchin kid, and my uncle in the show was a guy named Mako, who Mako, for the people out there that understand Mako's career, is one of the most uh, prolific Asian American actors of, of of our time. He's pa since passed away, and he was, you know, he was nominated for an Oscar with Sand Pebbles, and he's his voice and who he was has been around Hollywood my whole life. And he was someone I grew up with, and he played my uncle and my father several times in my career. And lastly, he played my uncle, Uncle Iroh, on Avatar: the Last Airbender, and he passed away in the shooting of that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Wow. Wow. There's a lot going on, I don't know. There's like, you know, you, re, you're, you rethink of your career and you just kind of, you know, things unfold. Yeah, were, were your parents uh, performing at the time? What, what influence did they have on No, th that's the magical thing about, th it's crazy thing about it really, is because my parents were not artists in that way. My dad was a, a telephone man and my mother was, uh, my mother, she, she, her job was to raise our family. And it was a clan of us, five kids, four boys and a girl. And to keep us off the streets, because we always grew up in blue collar towns, and uh, a lot of stuff can happen in blue collar towns, you know? To keep us off the streets and out of gangs or whatnot, she kept us busy in uh, everything from dance classes to martial arts to gymnastics to piano lessons to, you know, tap dance, culture dance, all that stuff. Like we did everything. And ironically, we, all those things we've learned growing up, we've used somehow in the film industry throughout our career. Um, so they weren't artists necessarily in that way they were just interested in kind of raising us and like supporting what we did and as a child actor your career is only as far as your parents will take you like literally take you sometimes to auditions and to classes and be supportive um and then we just be you know out of the blue we became artists they weren't artists and there and then all their kids became artists and that's that's kind of i don't know how that worked out it just kind of worked out and you were talking about training and working a lot once you get into it. Do you believe that uh, hard work can make up for natural talent? Yes. Hard work and talent. The thing about it is talent is amazing. And talent in this town is definitely gold. Like talent is amazing and you can see talent, but talent isn't always what wins. It's definitely not always what wins. I can prove it to everybody by watching go watch anything, <laughs> go watch TV, go watch films, the people in these films, and you know it, and we all know it, they're not the most talented people in a lot of these projects. When there is someone ultimately talented, you, you know, it stands out like a beam of light, right? And that's not, not, not to say that anyone working isn't talented, it's just like, not, it, you know, this is Hollywood, everyone has some talent. Um, the work is uh, is what kind of counts. The, the work you do, the hard work. People will always uh, confuse things about, you know, you always hear that the old saying is like, you gotta get lucky. You gotta be lucky, but of course you gotta be lucky. That's how this town works. Luck is a really big part of success in this town. But if you get good, you, will get luckier. And getting good is not lucky. Getting good is the work. You know what I'm saying? You confuse people like, oh, they're just lucky. No, they're good. To get good is to put the work in. And that's your job. Your actual job is to get good. The luckiness of this town is that you, the luck that somebody, as an actor, and I'm talking about as an actor, right? You hope, the luck is that someone wrote something for you. Not for you, somebody wrote a character six months to a year to 10 years ago 
that just happens to be the casting that you are right now in this moment in time. And you're, you know, the luck also goes that hopefully someone read it at a studio or a production company and said, this is good enough to put some money behind to produce. And then you're lucky that you know, out of the hundreds or maybe thousands of people who's ripe for the role that your agents and managers got you in to that casting record at this time for you to read for that role. And out of all those people that you were able to book that job, but not only that, you're, hope, you're lucky that if you are fortunate to get to do the project and it actually gets made and it gets out to the movie theaters or out to the TV, you know, through a TV or a platform, you hope or you're lucky enough that it comes out in a time that it matters to the audiences abroad. You know what I'm saying? That it has some impact on anybody and you hope that, you know, you're lucky enough that that happens. There's so many things that have yeah. to happen for for success to happen, you know, or whatever success may mean to you. But uh, yeah, a lot of line, a lot of stars have to line up. Yeah. But you're talking about preparation, meeting opportunity. Always, oh, be always get as always. prepared as possible, right? Yeah, preparation is important. Um, people ask me about my career, and uh, and the, and I explained to them like we've been studying me and my brothers and like our friends. I was in conservatory for t conservatory for twenty years. They're like, what? Like I studied acting for over twenty years, and not like often like straight. They're like, what are you talking about? Like some people are like I went to college for four years and we did this for two. I'm like, no, we studied religiously because. I mean, once you kind of get into it, you know, especially as a kid actor, you have to, you're almost voracious about it. Uh, and I've talked to parents that have kids coming to acting, and I say it's not unlike child athletes that are gifted. Um, you can't push them, you know what I'm saying? Like the Kobe Bryants, the young LeBron James, their parents wake up, they're on the basketball court in the backyard, or you know what I'm saying? Or at the, the local park. It's not on. It's not on you as a parent going. You need to do this. If the if a kid wants to have success, real success in a young age and wants to progress, um, first and foremost, it has to come from them. I have memories of waking my. You know, we would go back and forth in the Bay Area to uh, to to uh, L.A. because of our family and stuff like that. And I remember being in San Francisco over the weekend and like waking my dad up at like six, seven in the morning. Like, Dad, I got you got to get up. We have to get back to L.A. for acting class on Sunday like 12 years old. Wow. And I, I can't even think at this age of, you know, I don't have children, but if my kid, 10, 12 year old kid was like, tell me to wake up and like leave my weekend off to get back to a class, I would be like, are you kidding me? Like, but my parents, like again, that's the support of the parents. Got up, get, this, get everybody in the car, get everybody. You got Uber now. I know. But he's driving six hours from San Francisco to get us to LA for us to go to an acting class. But, you have that motivation as a as a child because that's your your urge of we want to do something you want to be good at something and then hopefully you you stumble upon teachers that can help you understand what not just good is but what great is and then you all of a sudden you're in the pursuit of greatness right success and money and fame and fortune may or may not come along the way but your pursuit of that greatness is kind of like at least for me and my brothers was really the the uh, just the igniting factor in like what we were trying to accomplish growing up as artists. So, what do you think drove you, especially at such a young age? What was uh, you know did, was there a bigger why behind uh, why you wanted to be? Performers? I don't know. I mean, I'm not 100 percent sure. We started dancing and we started dancing in the streets, and I think break dancing and b-boying and that era and like even to this like I'm a hip-hop artist like even to this day even though I become a filmmaker and an actor because I came from hip-hop I still consider myself a hip-hop artist in a lot of ways in, in this to this day and there's this thing when you're a kid and you're performing in front of you know hundreds maybe thousands of people sometimes in the streets and you're battling people you don't know and it's like this very primal art of dance and dance battle that carries through to Hollywood. Um, there's just this just, I don't know, I think one of the urges is like, you wanna be great, you wanna be 
dope, fresh. You want to like kill fools out. You want to be better than everybody else. There's like that thing. And I think that always, I think it serves you in Hollywood because every audition, every film you do is like a battle almost, you know, to prove yourself, to reprove yourself, to invent yourself, to reinvent yourself, to prove to the world, you know, who you are. And, um, and it, you know, there's the things that come along the way where you're kind of repping yourself, but then you're repping your family and then you're repping your community. And, and I came in a time where being one of the only Filipino actors in the industry, let alone Asian American actors in the industry, that you would do things and it meant a lot to a community when you do a prominent role and you did a good job and people had pride in, in, in what you were doing and what you are still doing. And so sometimes the work is very personal and it's an expression of how you feel or how you think and it's, and it's, it's a personal message you're putting out there. And then sometimes um, the work is, is beyond you. It's not even, you know, it's, it's adopted by a whole community and, and, or not even just, like there's certain characters that like Rufio or Prince Zucas goes even beyond the Asian American community, Pacific Islander community that, you know, they take these characters to mean things in their life, bigger things. And it, you, you have no control over that, you know? There's, I wrote a blog about, you, you know, you know you're officially a part of pop culture when, and it's like when, uh, when basically like your face is tattooed on strangers' bodies. <laughs> Do you see that? <laughs> yes. Um, always, people always, especially with, with, with social media now, you know, people send me stuff with things that get done and like my 15 year old face is on guys and girls' bodies and bang, that... bangering and like, it represents something that, that's not something we set out to do, but it's, it's the magic of art and the, the magic of, of, of Hollywood being able to impact uh, hopefully the world, but also impact individuals in very personal ways. It's amazing uh, that that film came out so long ago. I know. And you've, there's a, still this big, this, uh, new generations of fans for that movie. It's crazy. Well, with that in particular, like, again, I don't know if that's success, but it tells you, especially for artists, like sometimes you're humbled by the power of art, right? Because Peter Pan, the movie Hook, Peter Pan, you know, I grew up like many of us, like fans of other things, like Star Wars. I was like a big Star Wars fan growing up. I mean, even as things come out like Harry Potter, I'm a big, you know, fan of these immersive, great worlds that these storytellers in our generation have created, you know. Um, but Peter Pan is not even a, 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 an IP, an intellectual property or a franchise. Peter Pan's a fairy tale that's been around longer than any of us on this planet have been alive, that will be along probably longer than any of us on this planet will be alive, you know. And, uh, and it's just part of what is in the world and in the psyche of human nature, right, Peter Pan. And people will send you pictures, and, you know, they're at Disneyland and Halloween or wherever, and people are dressing up as like Peter Pan or and Captain Hook or a crocodile or some Tinkerbell. And then out of nowhere, 25 years ago, comes this little like Filipino kid with three mohawks in his hair in red and black, and it becomes a part of the, the Peter Pan story forevermore. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, and you go, and you just sit back and you're like, how did I become, not me personally, I mean me personally, but also me as an artist, become part of a fairy tale that Peter Pan means a lot to a lot of people. And to be a part of that and an impactful part of that forevermore is crazy. You know, it's like, and it's, it's crazy. It's things that you don't really set out to do as an artist, but um, you can kind of look back with perspective and go, wow, that's, that's kind of an accomplishment. It is. Yeah. yeah. It immortalizes you. Maybe, yeah. Maybe you're immortalized in some way. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not, yeah. not a bad way to look not at it. Not a bad it. way to look at it. Yeah. So what would you say your first big break was? There's been a lot of great, great breaks in between. Every break is a big break, right? The first time you book a job is a big break because... It means you're good. It means somebody thinks you're good, you know? Um, so, I mean, winning your first break dancing contest is a big break. Like you have to see your wins because it can't all be, I mean, Hook obviously is a big break and we could talk about Hook because that in and of itself changed my career and changed my life. 
right? But every win is important. You have to understand what a win is because that's the only thing that's going to, you know, bring you to the next thing. And the only way you can look at this life of, of, of artistry and this life in Hollywood and not go crazy because the reality is we're going to get way more no's than yeses. And people always ask about this or that, like what roles did you not get that you, like we can't think that way. If we, if we all dwelled upon that one audition we didn't get, like you're never going to move forward. You have to have, you have to have like a very short memory, um, because you just can't live in the past. It's always, you know, let's take what happened that was positive and then let's move forward. So, yeah, I think the big break is, you know, first of all, the first big break is making the decision to move to LA. You know, I always tell young actors, young artists, if you're here, you've already beat. 90% of the world. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The courage to get into a car, a plane, a train, a friggin' boat, a walk, I don't know, and get to Hollywood, you've already beat over 90% of the world to get here. So that's a big break in itself. And then being able to book your first job and, and feeling like, yeah, this could work out. The great thing when I did a hook, you know, I was 15. And I was uh, a very serious young actor. I started studying when I was 10. So by the time I'm 15, five years into the industry, I'm like, I'm a young vet. I mean, you know, I'm a kid, but you're still like this young vet. And I was very serious about my, my, my acting. And, um, and I knew my stuff because we were, we were training and, and training a lot. Uh, and when I got on the set, so when I worked with, when I first met Steven, he was like, you know, what were you doing with this other film? He's like we're talking about Perfect Weapon. Like, who is this? And I was like, oh, he's a street urchin. And I started talking about, you know, kids in the street. And I was like, oh, you know, like, like Razzo Rizzo and Midnight Cowboy. And he was like, what? Did you say Razzo Rizzo? I'm like, yeah. And, you know, Razzo Rizzo played by Dustin Hoffman. is in the movie playing Captain Hook. And we started talking about Dustin Hoffman and his career and Razzo Rizzo and John Voight. And, and we started talking the language of movies, you know, that's the kind of school I was raised in. And when you're talking about master filmmakers, you have to understand, you, you have to speak the same language. And we started to speak the same language and he ended up hiring me to do the movie. And we are on that film, the big break of that film is, uh, one of the biggest breaks of that film is to work with great artists, greatness. For all of us out there, young or old, especially young artists, even uh, any of us have been working, when you're in the presence of greatness, I uh, pray to whoever you want to pray to that you have the wherewithal to understand that you are in the presence of greatness and to sit there and friggin' listen and absorb and try to find out why they're so great or understand or just witness it. And of course, greatness in our, in our, field, right, Hollywood. Um, the greatness in any, I mean, if you're sitting next to LeBron James or Kobe Bryant or you're sitting next to a Fortune 500 billionaire, like sit down and go, okay, like just ch check it out. You know what I'm saying? There are people that are successful for a certain reason. But when I was 15, I thank God that I had the wherewithal to understand who I was working with. And I was so excited by that. I would come to the set on my days off and sit next to the camera. I'm not working. Like I'm not shooting anything. I'm not supposed to be there. But uh, I'm not going to school because I'm like working on a movie and I can go to the school and clock some hours in and then I can just go to the set and I can sit by the camera and I can sit right next to Steven Spielberg at the height of his powers and watch him direct a $100 million movie and I can watch Robin Williams act and improv and I can watch Dustin Hoffman. I mean, Robin Williams is, you know, the, you're talking about gods. In our industry, in our field, you're walking with gods. Like I said, Steven Spielberg at the height of his powers. And he's one of the greatest living directors of our time. Robin Williams, who is uh, probably the godfather of improv acting on film and television, 
who ushered in this idea of improving on film. And his so fa he's so fast and so witty and to see the magic of who Robin Williams is and have him creating on the set every day. And then Dustin Hoffman, who is on the Mount Rushmore of the 70s actors who've changed the face of acting. I mean, De Niro, Pacino, Hoffman, Nicholson, you know, they're like right in the lineage of Brando, Dean, Montgomery Cliff. I mean, like there's, there's a lineage of actors that us as actors that study acting, which goes today to like Daniel Day-Lewis and all, you know, there's a lineage of these actors that are the gods of our craft that have changed, every generation impacted what we do in a way that you're sitting there that you get to watch them perform, you get to watch them create is, is I always tell young artists is that it's the ability to go it's like being in the room to watch Picasso do a brush stroke or to be in a symphony hall and watch Mozart conduct a symphony. That's how important it is to know when you're in the company of greatness. Like you want to not just say I was there, you want to actually be present and pray to God a little bit just rubs off on you. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I would, that was, that's a big break to work with those guys and to be in that company, I mean, on top of Maggie Smith and Bob Hoskins, and I mean, there's so many people that came by there, but there's people throughout your career, there's always something to learn from everybody. And uh, so that was a really big break and when, you're, when, you're, when you have the platform like that in Hollywood, that kind of completely changed a lot of how Hollywood saw me, you know, in, in the world, so. Yeah, Hollywood royalty for sure. Hollywood royalty. And, and I'm a big fan of mentorship. It, it, even virtual mentorship. Of course. When you can, even if it just takes the form of you watching these masters do their thing, it's so valuable, such a privilege. Yeah. Who do you learn from today? God, there's so many people. Um, I'm fascinated in a lot of things, right? So acting, my acting career has continued to, to go along, but also I've expanded into uh, writing, producing, uh, directing soon. And so I started my whole writing career as a poet, and I started a poetry venue in my living room over 20 years ago, which became a very influential poetry venue in Hollywood and in the world of poetry. It became the inspiration, which became Deaf Poetry Jam on HBO and on Broadway, which won a Tony. And, um, and to this day is the largest weekly open mic venue in the world. And so learning from all those poets that we came up and inspired each other, but also seen the ones that really uh, went to other, you know, stratospheres, uh, and to see those guys work and being inspired by what they did. And then on the set, now as a producer, sitting along, you know, other producers and not know, you know, you don't know anything, so you're you're really just kind of sitting there learning what they're doing as producers. Such a elusive uh, job on the set, which you know, and there's there's several ways to produce, like what kind of producer are you? Like, what are you doing? Are you doing, you know, I'm not the line producing type, you know, you're the creative type trying to get people in the same room together and trying to talk story and trying to solve problems every day on the set uh, is pretty, pretty crazy. And, and then as a social media thing happened, I really, ironically was mentored a lot by a lot of the new generation. These younger kids that grew up watching me, right, in my career, and really they became my mentors, like my, my juniors, which is, was fascinating, you know. I mean, two that come to mind, uh, Kev Jumbo is a big YouTuber, also another big YouTuber, AJ Raphael. And uh, years ago, when, when I first was starting to produce, we were gonna do a movie together. I met these kids. They were kids at the time. I think AJ was probably 21, and Kev was probably 19, 20. And we met him, I met him at a bar. Kev wasn't even known as being in the bar. And, uh, and you know, we were talking about possibly doing a project together, and they had like millions of followers on YouTube and social medias. And they were like, they were like, hey, you, you need to get online. And I go, what? Now, you need to get online. I'm like, I'm not getting online. That's not my that's not my generation. That's not me. Like, I'm not online. And then I just remember, you know, I think it was AJ looked at me and said, Hey, uh, you're online. 
like Google yourself. Like you're online. And then Kev was like, yeah, if you're not taking control of this conversation about you, then you're missing out on a lot of power of what that is. And beyond that, I'm sure if we really research it, there's probably six people online saying they're you right now anyway. And I'm like, what? And so I became a student of social media and really was mentored by these dudes and other, other the kids really. I mean, my fascination with where media is going with the birth of social media, it's very different than what we're doing in traditional media, but the world has changed. This is the biggest change in the history of the world, at least in American culture, but I think in the world, since the baby boomers probably, the, the, the amount of disconnect and distance between those generations is the same thing going on now. And I just digested through digital and traditional media because I see, and I've seen and experienced the disconnect between Hollywood and the digital age. And, um, and, the, and our generation's pushback for many years, we're finally trying to catch up and kind of accept, like, I guess this is what it's gonna be now. We don't even understand what's going on, but we're just gonna follow the tide. But there's really magical things going on. I really believe that our generation is the gap generation between what has been and where it's going. And uh, the great thing is, you know, we are able, we're still connected, like these young kids that I work with that are mentoring me in this new world. And I've, I've been able to catch up a lot faster than a lot of people in my generation. I did a talk at South by Southwest about social media like two years ago, right? It's like these two 21 year old kids with millions of followers on all these platforms and me. And I was like 40 at the time or something like that. And I was like, why am I here? <laughs> And I remember the head of audience at Maker Studios was like, you're here because you've adopted social media unlike anyone your age. And you're able to talk about it in a way that they can't talk about because they haven't experienced what you experienced. And so the conversation was really fascinating because we are connected to another kind of filmmaking that's not really done the same way anymore. And it's moving so much faster. And what I'm able to do when I talk to the new generation is go, is to tell them that there's so much we need to learn from you because the world has changed and you're doing things innately in social media and media and communication that has never been done before. You don't even, you know, I, I told like Kev Jump and these kids, I'm like, you guys are running a TV channel. Um, you guys are writing, directing, producing, acting successfully. You're making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars doing this. And you're almost like children, like, you know, just geniuses. And, and you know, without any disrespect, like you don't even know what you're doing yet. Like, you don't even know what you're doing. Not, I mean, not to disrespect, you know what you're doing, but you don't know what you're, there's a lot of things you're doing, you don't even know what you're doing. There are actually a lot of things you can still learn from us. Like we have to learn so much from you, but there's still so much that you can learn from us. And so the gap generation, I think our job is to like be that bridge to kind of go back and forth and see what, what, we, what, what we can create. Yeah, the, the world is moving fast. I mean, if you just look at the last 10 years where it went, like you, I've resisted that for the longest yeah. time. It took me forever to get on Facebook, Instagram, and even now I'm, I'm just starting to make a push. And right. so luckily I, I'm fortunate to have, a, to, to have a, one of those geniuses too. And, in my camp over here. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, at least you're smart enough to surround yeah. yourself with people that do know. And, and yeah. uh, you know, I think we're all, young and old, we're all, it, we're still asking so many questions because it's still the wild, wild west and, you know, no one really knows. We're all just kind of doing it and yeah. like pivoting as we go along. A lot of great success and everything, but it wasn't always easy, obviously. Where would you say you struggled most in your life? You know, there's so many struggles in a long career, there's, there's always ups and downs. Um, Was there a turning point at one of these? Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. I remember being like really broke somewhere in my 20s. There's like one time in my life I had to get a job. I had to get, I'm not a regular job, you know? And uh, the story behind that, I remember it very vividly because when you're a young actor, you just kind of like out blowing money and partying and just not really thinking. And you, anyone, everyone can go through dry spells. And, and especially in this town, you may not work for like six months a year and you're like, whoa, I just spent all my money. But um, 
what do you do when you blow all your money? And it happens to, the great thing about having, you're talking about the struggles, you go through your own struggles, but when you're a part of a group of artists, you get to go through other people's struggles also. You know, and the key thing that you get to is the support of others, the support. I mean, that just happens to be a lot of the, my group was my family, my brothers, who we all studied together. But I was like broke. Like, I, I think I spent all my money and when you, even more. The, what you realize when you're young is you think when you have no money, you think you're broke, right? But then you don't realize you can go past broke. You can, <laughs> you can be like overdrawn credit cards. Like it doesn't stop at zero. It goes to like, oh, I'm like. Been there. In debt broke. That's like a different kind of broke. And, I, and I, a very dark time for me in my life at that time in my early 20s. I just remember being in my bed literally with the covers over my head you know and you're like waking up like i think i have to get a job you know like you're like kind of half awake like do i have to get a job i and i don't have any skills cuz i've been an actor since i was 10 like i don't really have any real world skills all i have is like acting skills like that's the only resume i have and i'm just in the bed and the phone's ringing right and uh, and it's back in the days when we had we had uh, answering machines, phones ringing, ding ding, and I don't pick up the phone. And my just heads under the covers, and the phone picks up. And I remember distinctly it was an old friend who was an actor, a guy named Marlon, who worked at uh, who worked at a restaurant my oldest brother worked at back in the day. And he's calling, and it's like early in the morning, and I'm like, oh, God, what's what's going on? And he's like, Hey, yo, anyone home? Pick up, someone pick up. It's Marlon. It's Marlon. Uh, Hey, I'm in jail, and I was like, "What?" I pick up the phone. Like, Yo, what's up, man? And he, you know, he, I'm. He got into some incident and a fight. All this really bad stuff had happened the night before. He's in jail. You know, can he call up his dad, who's a lawyer? Can I three way call his dad and like help him get out of this fix? And I, you know, I spent the better part of the next hour just kind of being the proxy, third three way caller from a friend of mine in jail. And when I hung up the phone, I remember thinking, you know, uh, those baddest things are right now, I'm not in jail. Like, I'm not in prison at the moment. And so I got in my car and went around looking for a job. I had a job by the end of the day. I was parking cars at a, a restaurant in Santa Monica, Gladstones on the beach, and, uh, and just did it, you know? And like I said earlier, the great thing is you have support of your you know your your support system when you're when you're out especially in this in in hollywood and, and i can only speak for hollywood because that's where i grew up um the company you keep can make or break you i mean when people talk about this town swallowing you swallowing you up it's not that town it's the company you keep in town and you're blessed and sometimes you're blessed by luck by falling into the right group of friends and extended family that a we're all in the pursuit of the same thing and we're all in the same mind and you know it's a loving caring environment where people really have your back and are there to support you and in hard times you know you're a, someone's able to help stuff like pay your rent or sleep on your couch and and you also uh, and also it was return favors you know and you you're part of a uh, fraternity of artists that really uh root and support for each other and so in the dark times and in the heavy times it's like those are the those are the people that kind of get you through and you're able to appreciate because like I said earlier you're able to support and help friends through their dark struggles and uh and when you know and everybody celebrates when everybody wins yeah that's really important mm -hmm. you always hear about LA especially how competitive and cutthroat it is like you're talking about what do you think the most misunderstood thing is about Hollywood? The most misunderstood thing about Hollywood and about the competitiveness of Hollywood is you're actually not in competition with anybody but yourself. That's where a lot of people mistake and have so much hardship and pain and they don't understand that this is not a sport. This is not a race. Do you understand? It's like, and I've had it, I've had it in a very intimate way because I've studied with my brothers and I've 
acted alongside my brothers for years. My brothers are all in my same age range, same look. We have auditioned against each other throughout our career and still continue to audition. We just were up for a TV show and um, it came down to between me and one of my brothers. Like when you're pinned, they say you're pinned, that means you're on the wall, literally pinned your pictures next to each other and it's between you two. And uh, my brother Darian ended up booking that role for, uh, for a TV show. And um, what the misconception is, people think it's a sport, it's a race. You can't, there's no win or loser like that. You can't, there's no way I can run, like for that role. There's nothing you can do to run any faster to beat someone else. What you have to understand is this is not a sport. You are only in competition with yourself. Outside of you doing a good job, your job is to actually just do as good as you can do. That's the only competition there is. Outside of that, there is nothing you can do. If someone want, like if we were up for the same part, right? If they're gonna hire Dante, they want a they want Dante. There's nothing you can do to be me. And vice versa, if you, they, if you get the job, there's nothing I can do to be more Jay. There's just nothing I can do. And you, the misconception is you can do all these, you, you can mess with your mind about trying to chase what they want when what you really have to do is kind of be the best that you can be. And then hopefully you and the right role come into cross paths at the right time. And that is the misconception is you can, you know, you could do all this thing. You know, it's just not a race. It's not a sport. There's nothing you could do to kind of like muscle your way to be any better than who you are. It's really a very, it becomes, you know, it sounds weird and zenful and like spiritual, but there is a have faith kind of thing in what this industry is. And as an actor and as an artist, um, we have a simple saying in our group. It's like we always say like, you get what you get and you don't get upset. Because in the end, you're gonna get what's meant for you. Yeah. And you can't, there's actually nothing more or less you can do than that. I mean, what you can do, what you can, not you shouldn't beat yourself up, but what you know when you are failing is when you're not doing the best you could do. You're not preparing enough, you're not, you don't know, you even really can broke down the script, the character, you haven't prepared to your abilities, that's when you know you're failing, you know? But as far as whether you book jobs or not book jobs, now that I'm on the other side of the, of the desk and I'm producing and writing and directing and I'm able to help cast, I'm, all, I'm knowing firsthand that it's not always the best actor that wins the role. There's so many reasons why we need to hire people or you get hired or you don't get hired, how it looks, there's political reasons within financing and studios, there's also scheduling reasons, there's uh, puzzle pieces of different cast members, there's, there's a million other reasons. You should never not get a role because you're a bad actor, that's on you. Like, we're not hiring them because they're a bad actor, that's solely on you. Everything outside of that, you, can't, you don't have power over that necessarily. Um, and that's the misconceptions you think that you kind of like, outwork everybody you can't really outwork everybody you you need to really uh make sure you're doing your your best job for yourself yeah it's very it's fascinating this town is so crazy because we we know i always tell people the ironic thing about this town is we're all we're always 90 90 percent of the time we're out here trying to play these characters that are these like normal people in the world and like there's nobody normal in this town None of us are normal. We're actually out here doing something that is abnormal. We're trying to do something that is beyond ourselves and impact the world, become these stars or these voices or these artists that are good. You know, that's what we're here doing. And like all the characters are playing are these normal people. And like, what in the heck do we know about normal people? But that's our job is to study the human condition and try to, to tell these stories. Um, but the other misconception is like, uh, we don't realize that they're hiring you, you. Like nine out of 10 times, maybe 99 out of 100 times, um, they're hiring you. So it's like the, 
They say the people that are most comfortable in their own skin in this town are able to ultimately find the parts that are going to match up with them correctly. Uh, as much as we want to create all these characters and do these things outside of ourselves, um, the character's stuck with you and you're stuck with the character. So you are a really big part of the equation, so you better do some work on you and understand who you are because you can only go as far into characters and the work as you are developed yourself. And so as much as we think we're actors and we're doing something outside of ourselves, we're actually, ourselves is the main ingredient in all the characters we do. So like, that's a really big misconception. Like we're out here, you're just out here playing other people. No, you're not. I'm actually playing, I'm actually being myself in a, in a very intimate way or trying to expand who I am within these other roles. That's a really powerful um, insight on, on the way that works. And it's funny that, you know, it's about the authenticity of how to be your best self and be you and authentically you so that you can get hired to play your role to, of being somebody else. Somebody, somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, yeah, there's a lot of meta stuff going on there, but yes. Yeah, yeah. So what is it that you are trying to say with your art? I don't know if there's an overall, you know, theme of what's going on when I look at my career over the last 30 years. What I realize though, as I look at things in perspective, which makes it big and small, right? Is we're, we're filmmakers and actors and artists and all this stuff, but really what we are, we're storytellers. We're just telling stories. And that's the, like the simplicity of it, right? Um, which makes it feel doable and, and like, yeah, we're just, it's so easy. Like we're here to just tell stories, which sounds so elementary. Knowing that if you tell a great story, it could change the world. And that takes something so simple into this really impactful mood. So as I've gotten older in this industry and understood storytelling and, and, and been a part of, uh, of movements like the Asian American movement and been a part of impactful projects, I understand that what I really want to do is make impact. In this town, impact is more valuable than gold. Impact. If you could tell a story, you want to make money. We all want to make money. We all got a pair of bills. Fame and money is fleeting. You know, impact is something that is, you can't buy. You can't buy. When you tell a great story and that story lives on for generations, that's impact. Or you're able to even if it doesn't live on for generations, if you're able to tell a story and you're able to open someone's eyes or open someone's perspective on someone or something, that's impactful. When I talk to someone, and uh, like when I did growing up in my career, there's a lot of people out there, Asian American people, or otherwise, like you're the first cool Asian I ever saw in my life, in, especially in Hollywood. You, you changed what I thought an Asian person could be. That's impact, right? Let alone you tell a story that will change someone's whole perspective on how they see their own life or see their parents' life or, or how they're gonna change or influence them, how they're gonna react to someone or, you know, it's weird things, it's strange things. I talk to, you know, I'll meet a lot of times, especially on online or even in public, in just in real life, someone will come to me, like interracial couple will come to me, right? And this guy, Asian guy, and like, say like a white girl. And he's like, oh, you know, Growing up, man, like my, my wife, she had like this big crush on you. I'm like, okay. And she's like, you know, so I know you're definitely one of the reasons why she married me. Crazy. <laughs> Little things like that, that again, are funny and frivolous, but impactful in ways. So I know that as an artist now, I want to do work that is impactful. Like, yeah, you want to make money. You want, you know, you're young and you're chasing fame and fortune. Awesome, that's a part of all of our urge, but as you are around longer, you wanna tell a great story that's gonna have some impact. And that's really, that's really the goal. So how do you wanna be remembered? 
I think as you as I've gotten older, what I've realized is as my career continues, you know, like I probably work for the rest of my life in one way or another in this industry and you're always a gun for hire as an artist. But when you start writing and producing, you start becoming the storytellers. Um, you, I found a lot of uh, just fulfillment in creating not just opportunity, opportunities for myself, but creating opportunities for others. And then helping to lay pavement for the next generation. Because ultimately, you know, as I've gotten older, younger cats have come up and people are always asking like, oh, what do you think about this person, this person? Like, are you scared so-and-so is gonna, you know, do? No, I'm not scared of any of that. You're not supposed to be scared of the next generation surpassing you. That's what the next generation is supposed to do. And we're supposed to help that. That's exactly the cycle of life. That's what we're here to do. We're supposed to create opportunities for the next generation to surpass us and to do great work and to be a part of that great work. You know what I'm saying? So I find a lot of uh, fulfillment as I've created like an Asian American Pacific Island production company and creating these new platforms and going into Asia and raising money and doing stuff uh, and hiring new artists and being inspired by what they're doing and getting a kick of them being inspired by what I, things I've done and then creating brand new cool things. Um, I think that's the legacy. The legacy isn't just this idea of doing, I mean, the impact and telling these stories that will last forever, that's great. But also the actual legacy is hiring and creating pavement for the next generation to keep rolling and to, to surpass us and to do amazing things. You know, in large part, that's what this show is about. It's about kind of how will you impact that next generation so that you have a legacy that lives on in them, in the people that you help, mm -hmm. right? What's, uh, what is the most important thing to you? I think the most important thing to me is staying creative. That is, that's it. I mean, when people always are like, how did you survive so long in this industry? How do you continue to survive in this industry? The, you know, when I, when I talk at colleges and do keynotes for colleges or companies and every keynote, every TED talks about overcoming some major obstacles, right? And like, the thing about my story that people are in wonderment about when I go talk is, especially Asian American groups, right? Colleges and whatnot, is how was I able to survive in a industry, especially at the time when I was coming up, as an Asian American actor, and more specifically a Filipino American actor, with zero Filipino and Asian roles in Hollywood, yet me, Dante Bosco, is able to not just survive in a, a famine situation, but been able to flourish and prosper. Like, they're like, mathematically, this is impossible, right? And as you talk about it, um, it is impossible, but the whole thing about Hollywood is to defy the impossibilities. The reality is Hollywood's not set up for you to make up. You're not gonna make it. Most of us, the millions of people that come into town are not going to make it. It's not set up for you to make, but if you work hard enough, you will make it. You can make it. It's, it's, it's hard for, you know, anyone, I'm Asian, it's hard to be white in Hollywood, black in Hollywood, Latino in Hollywood, very hard to be Asian in Hollywood. It's hard to make it in this town, period. But uh, you're, you're, we're, you know, you gotta be here, you are defying the odds, that's what, that's what you're here for. So you really gotta have the grit to, to see it through. How does one keep going then? Yeah, it's the create, that's what it is. They're like, how do you do it? It's staying creative. Because even when I'm not working, I'm always creating something. People are like, oh my God, you're always, through all my time in, in, my, in my young days in acting schools, we produced showcase after showcase where we're in acting. I was one of the producers of over, I don't know, countless, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 showcases, um, plays in the plays, producing the plays. Before that, we were doing breakdancing shows, doing uh, just competitions, 
starting a poetry venue, growing that over the years, 20 plus years of doing that, having a band performing all over LA with my brothers and doing studio work and creating stuff, then starting to do independent films, raising money with friends, shooting movies. The thing is, it's staying creative. We are creators, we are creatives. You need to, you, you are what you do most of the time, period. So if you're a creative, you better be creating. If you're an actor, you better be acting. If you're only acting once in a blue moon, then don't call yourself an actor. You know what I'm saying? Whatever you say you are, do that. Stay creative. It's like that's what kind of kept it going is like there was no time to 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 sit back and kind of like rest on your laurels because there's always something new to create. There's something you want to say. There's a song you want to write. There's a poem you want to write. You, you know, I'll do it for money. I'll do it for no money. I'll come into the club, jump on a bar, spit bars of poems, um, write a song, go in the studio, get with the band, go tour with it. Uh, you know, I realized recently I was on a set and uh, all these years later, I realized like my life, the simplicity of life has been, um, let's put on a show. What does that mean? You're going to go, someone has an idea of let's put on a show and then you get a routine or a thing, you, you prepare it, you rehearse it with friends and you have these times and then you get it ready and then you take a deep breath and you get on stage in front of people and you perform it for the world. And that could be break dancing routine on the streets of San Francisco. It could be a play in regional theater. It could be a short film somewhere in the valley. It could be a TV show on the Warner Brothers lot. It could be a movie shooting on location somewhere in Canada. I mean, it's the same process over and over, and you kind of fall in love with that process and the simplicity of what you do, and, and you realize that's what we do. And today there's the vlogs. I see you on social media just live. Yeah. All of a sudden, there's been some spoken word spoken poetry. Spoken word poetry. That's really, you know, these, these new outlets are, there's a fear of, uh, of, of, of everything. The world's changed. The whole thing about the world has changed is it's actually changed completely different. Us growing up in the 80s and 90s, the more famous you got, the more untouchable you got, the more elusive would you, you were. The most famous people on the planet were Michael Jackson, Madonna, Prince, and those people were so untouchable. When they stood in front of you as a human, they didn't seem real. If you stood in front of Michael Jackson, and I had a dance for him when I was younger, he doesn't seem like a real person standing in front of you. And now, the more famous you get, the more accessible in some ways you are, the more you let people into your world. And this is like, never thought, it's really changed our whole mindset of what we think celebrity is and how to deal with it. And uh, there's been a lot of growing pains for a lot of people, um, myself included, and, uh, and, and how to get involved in the engagement of social media, what to share, what not. There's still an art of it. And I always tell friends now, especially of, uh, the older generation that want to get involved in it and are scared of it, I, I just remind them that they're artists and you can do it artfully. If you attempt to do it artfully, you can have an artful way of doing it and you're engaging with the audience and, uh, and, and great things could happen. So what excites you most today? Um, the most exciting things for me today is still the same stuff it's been for my whole career. It's just making stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's the biggest part, you know, when you're talking with artists and actors, like we, you know, we could spend all day long, you know, in coffee shops or whatnot talking about what we want to do and, and what's great and what's not great or that's not good. And, and that's just, we'll be forever with artists. And that's, that's how we talk shop. That's just like people on the sports channels talking about the sports, right? But the most exciting thing and what we need to always force ourselves to do is to actually create product. That's, Again, that's another misconception that we talked about earlier. It's like, you want to get good and be good, but it's not just being good. You need to make something. You need to make something that is saleable, that is tangible. We are artists. You need to go out and like 
do it. And, uh, and it's not always going to be great. Matter of fact, it's probably going to start not good. But the exciting thing, the things I'm most excited about is actually getting the crew together and doing it, putting it on film or putting it on digital or putting it on a stage and, and, and creating product. The only, the only real way to succeed in this town is to actually create product. Like, we need to produce. That's the one thing that the digital age taught us, that we can't, we can't uh, forget. You know, there's a, when it first happened, a lot of my friends in the traditional media were like, they really just hated, like, we hate what these kids are doing. It's all crap. It's like low budget. Like, they don't know what they're doing, right? And, and, and it's, not, um, it's not untruthful. It's like, they didn't know what they were doing. But I said, you know, they inherited the town. It actually, the thing about us that we get, our feelings hurt, our generation, is that we thought we were gonna inherit the town and actually, they did. It actually skipped us in a lot of ways. And I go, why did that happen? I say, you know why it happened? Because they outproduced us. They created more than we created. We had all these kids from film school holding on to scripts for 10 years plus, trying to get one movie made, and these kids have been making 10,000 videos that we think is crap, but they, we did, what they real, they didn't realize it, but they came into a time where how the world works is you can outproduce the, everything else. What matters is production, is about making things. And the more you make, you will catch up. They have caught up. And in catching up, they actually garnered the audience that grew with them. And now they, they, inherited a town or they're inheriting a town that we thought we were going to inherit because every generation inherited it except for the world changed and now we got outproduced and so what i like to challenge artists to do now is to create things and produce things make it happen put it out there in the world start it doesn't have to be perfect matter of fact it shouldn't be perfect um you just got to keep making one make this one then make the next one then make the next one and then that's what counts. What, that is the actual legacy is what did you leave behind? What did you make? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not what you <laughs> talked about making. What did you actually make? And don't be so precious about it sometimes because you make that. That's great. That's going to do what it's going to do. Go make the next one. Right. And if, and if you do put it out there and it's perfect, then you probably started late, right? It's not perfect. First of all, <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. The, the one thing, because we've been around long enough, and I, and I try to tell the young filmmakers out there, especially that are out, out, right out of film school, that are very idealistic, and they're really complaining about everybody else's quality, I go, just go make a movie. If you haven't made one yet, go make a movie. Because it doesn't matter what you make, what you think it's going to be, you're going to look at that movie two years from now, you're going to say it's a piece of crap. Doesn't matter what you make, you're gonna go that I, that was crap. So make it, then make the next one. You're a filmmaker, go make films. That's your job. It's your. It's not our jobs on sets as actors and writers and producers to be like how great of a movie we're making. That's the audience and the critics' jobs that are gonna tell us what kind of greatness we did ten years from now. You know what I'm saying? What our job is, is to make movies and to try to make the soil every day that something magic could happen on set that day. Because when we're making movies, we think of our, when you think of your favorite movie, um, the movie isn't actually your favorite movie. What is actually you're responding to is a moment in the movie. Those are your favorite things about a movie. If you can do a movie and you can make one memorable moment, you've actually done something. If you have like five or six memorable moments, you might have done The Godfather. You know what I'm saying? As a young filmmaker, your goal every day, and my goal as a producer, and our goal as a film is to create the environment that the possibility of something magical could happen on set today and we can get lucky and capture it. Wow. That's it. That's something to think about. That's something to that's, think about. That's, that really is. It's about creating that, the, the movie is that, is that conduit 
to just create that one moment. One moment. I love that. If you could get that that moment, you're doing something pretty amazing. All right, let's do a uh, let's do a quick speed round here. All right, speed round. All right, all right, Dante. Guilty pleasure. Guilty pleasure. Uh, ice cream. Uh, Pints of ice cream. Secret talent. Harmonica. Favorite vice. Uh, video games. League of Legends. I play MOBA. League of Legends. Celebrity crush. Uh, so many of them. Who's a recent celebrity crush? Uh, I like e- Emmy Rossum. Emmy Rossum. Yeah. Shameless. Yeah. Shameless, yes. Yeah, okay. I gotcha. Superpower you'd like to have? <sighs> yeah. Uh, I mean, come on. Firebending. Firebending. Of course. Of course, right? Favorite actor of all time? <sighs> I mean, my actor growing up was Montgomery Clift. Montgomery Clift. He was... Uh, Again, we were talking about this earlier, right? But like actors, the mentorship, even the mentorship from afar. I think every young actor, you know, you need to. Uh, in part, in our class, we all chose actors that we would be our mentors, and you'd watch all their movies, and you would read all the books on them, and you would, uh, and you would hopefully let that kind of impact you. And Montgomery Clift was my my guy. Awesome. Song you sing in the shower the most. Um, right now, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, lately, I that song Rihanna's work, 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 work. It kind of got back in my head recently a lot. I like that song, with Rihanna. <laughs> Something you wish you were better at? Um, singing, singing. I like singing, but I wish you know there's some Filipinos that could really, really sing. It's like I was always a better dancer than a singer, but I always thought if only I could really sing. The world, the world's not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, something we should all be paying more attention to. Uh, I think we should all be paying more attention to uh, just politics right now. It's so weird. We're at a very, like I said, the world is changing. This is like a big turning point in the world, and myself included. You know, we need to pay attention more to what's going on because we don't know where the world's going. We have, we're at a crossroads. We should vote. Is that what you're saying? We should vote, and we should be more attentive to what is going on because uh, the world's changed. The world has changed. The world that we know it has completely changed, and we don't necessarily know where we're going. Amen. Dante, you've always been the most one of the most fascinating people that I've met in this town. You've always got something going on. I'm seeing you all over social media for a guy who's like resisted it for so long. Yeah. You certainly have uh, reinvented yourself on social media, but I really appreciate you coming down. How do we find out more about you? Where do we find you? Yeah, just follow me. Follow me at Dante Bosco on Instagram and on uh, Facebook. Uh, follow me at Dante Bosco on Instagram and Twitter and official Dante Bosco on Facebook or uh, Rufio Zuko on Tumblr. And uh, around those worlds, you'll just kind of you could paste together what I'm doing in the world. All right. More to come. Yeah. All right. Pleasure, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's a wrap. Want to meet more incredible guests? Then don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a thing. And let me know what you think in the comments. Your feedback is always welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jay Menez, and I'll see you on the next episode of Hollywood Reel. Hollywood Reel.